Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this morning's study. Um, we're going to continue looking at uh, putting uh, Ehud and Shamgar on a line. Uh, but before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time we have here this morning. May your Holy Spirit speak to us as we open your word together. We know, Lord, the things that we are studying um, are very involved, and we know that those watching it uh, are doing their best to keep up with the light that's coming. But we just pray, Lord, that um, um, the light that we receive and that we can share with others, that we can understand it. We pray for each person, for the particular needs that they have, and we pray for our plans uh, for this year. Um, and we know that this, this study here in Judges is very important to this movement, so we just ask that we can get things right. We ask this, and be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> So, you know, we had tentatively put th some things out on the line with Ehud, but I want to look at Ehud a little bit more here in detail in Judges. Um, because, you know, I put things on a line as far as what, where I think they should go, but we need to look at the details here in this story. So just to quickly go through this, so we're not going to go through this as much detail as we did in the past. Um, Ehud um, is going against Moab. So Moab has um, is the group that's oppressing um, Israel. And we know that they possess the cities of the city of the palm trees. So they have Jericho. And this is, of course, a symbol of the 2520. Now, Ehud, as a message coming to this movement in the story of the judges, would relate to um, the 2520 being understood in this message. Whatever date we would choose for that, I don't think we've ever nailed it down specifically. Because um, I don't think we know the date exactly when Jeff first presented it, but maybe somebody does. Because um, I believe he first present, uh, presented it in California. Um, and it was him just having this thing that he had studied that he then drew on a line um, because he had finished the material that he had. That's my understanding of, of that presentation and that it was at the beginning of, of uh, 2005. So um, there could be more, more to that, but that's, that's what we have for the beginning of this. So we know that um, uh, there's this 18 year period that's being mentioned. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. And, you know, Dwight suggested that 18 years is, is 18 is reversed is 81. That has to do with midnight. I don't think in this case that, that I would do that, but I'm not saying it's wrong. I just, my mind, it doesn't it doesn't fit with where we are in this in this line. Um, uh, but eighteen can be a symbol in other ways. So, what other ways can eighteen be a symbol? Right, so we have it as a symbol of six plus six plus six. So that we know that this, this does relate to the Sunday law, which is what this line is about. We also put Ehud as the, the arrival of the second angel as in the line of uh, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. And so uh, the second angel's message is really proclaiming the coming Sunday law. Um, and I also figured out another way to connect it to 666 as well, uh, dealing with uh, the number of months. But 
So we can take 18 as symbol of the Sunday law. That's what we would look at it as. Now, the children of Israel are going to cry unto the Lord. They get raised up this deliverer, Ehud. And Ehud is... Um, what do we know about him? His name means united. He's the great-grandson of Benjamin, so he's a Benjamite. So what? why is he to mean to unify or united? What is the characteristic that's being presented here regarding Ehud? Would he be a symbol of the unity that is to exist within the movement in order okay. to go forward? Yeah, so it'd be, yeah, the unity that... Uh, that this movement needs through the Holy Spirit, right? So we have the work of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. They all go together as the arrival of this first message, this message of the work of the Holy Spirit, and the one is a call to unity. Now, the 2520 itself, how would that relate to unity in this movement? Would it be that the 2520 is the acceptance of the message of the blessings? Okay. Um, well, I mean, the 2520, you know, deals with the blessings and the curses. The 2520 has to do with uh, the curses that come upon God's people. But is, is the proclamation of the 2520 in our movement something that unites it? It should, if we're studying truth. Yeah. But I'm talking about just historically in our movement. It, do, it is something around which this movement uh, really unified. Mm -hmm. Now, it, and it was the one thing that really all were agreed upon. I mean... In some ways, you know, the criticism of the of those that opposed our movement that it's the twenty five twenty movement. Um, but in some ways, that sort of was true. Even though that wasn't primarily the message that this movement started with, um, it definitely was a message around which opposition united against this movement. And the 2520 just had that ring of something that you could then label. It was, it was a really good, catchy label. You know, if we're looking at it from a marketing perspective, um, Jeff didn't really have any kind of label prior to that. Uh, but the 2520 did um, sort of get this movement labeled. But it also attracted lots of people to the movement. Not necessarily always for the right reasons, but people came to the movement because of the 2520. Prior to that, I don't know if there was even, even an understanding that there was a movement other than there was Jeff and, and ministries were interested in what he was teaching. But it really, a lot of these ministries came because of the 2520. So that could be part of it. Okay, so we know he's the son of Gera. He's a Benjamite, right? So he's also left-handed. And what would really left-handed be about? Well, if I'm not mistaken, left-handed people make up about 7% of the world's population. Okay. Left-handed people are also right brain dominant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. So there's, there's quite a bit 
I mean, the the difference in being right brain dominant can be. I mean, it, I, I believe they're they're quite a bit more creative. Their problem solving skill set is a little different than those that are left brain dominant. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if I really believe the left right brain dominant thing, but but I do know the right brain is different than the left brain because I dealt with stroke patients for years, and uh, you know the left left side of the brain deals with language, mm -hmm. the right side of the brain is more spatial. So if somebody has a stroke on the left side of their brain, uh, they may not be able to communicate, but they generally are fairly happy. Somebody gets a stroke on the right side of the brain, they're, they're confident that they can do things. They have good language skills. But if you give them a walker and ask them to walk, they'll walk into the corner of the room. And um, they often have a very sen uh, dry sense of humor and are usually depressed. That's, you know, generalization, especially when you see them right after a stroke, because that's when we would see them in physio would be right after they've had their stroke and they're just going to start uh, doing some physio. But anyway, um, I think the main thing here dealing with the left handed is Benjamin means son of the right hand. So if you have a son of the right hand who's left handed, what does that mean? Is that kind of a chiasm? It's definitely different. Yeah. So, I mean, and I know there was a group of Benjamites that were left-handed, um, which I always thought was funny. But, um, yeah. Could, and, and so when you look at, uh, you know, the name Benjamin, right, it means the son of uh, Yemi, right? Yemi means... Uh, um, uh, so right hand, and then you have this, uh, or Yemen, Yemi means hand. So the Yod, Yod, Yemi, let me see here. Yemi, right hand. Ah, so that's what they have. So here, uh, what, what the word is in Hebrew, the, it actually is, uh, the way that they say that somebody's left-handed is he's right hand impeded, oh. right? So it um, itar or iter means shut up. That is technically their right hand is shut up. That's what it means when they're left-handed. So they don't use the word left when they say somebody's left-handed. They still say right hand. So yamin. So it's still um, yad, which means hand, and yamin, which means right. And so it's shut, shut up hand right, literally, in Hebrew. It's kind of a strange okay. way of saying it. Yep. I'm going to go out on a limb and ask a question. No pun intended. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> um, does right-handed necessarily mean you're following truth and left error no or does this have nothing to do with anything no it, it wouldn't um though though there could be implications in that to some degree but here in the idea that he's left-handed has to do with um often has to do with um in this case it has to do with the sword that he's going to use okay right because it's under the raiment on his right thigh. So when he takes out this sword. So because he's left-handed, the reason why they mention it is because he's going to take this from his right mm -hmm. thigh, this sword, and lift it okay. right with his left hand. Okay. So he has this dagger, this two-edged dagger, a cubit in length, which we're going to say is 18 inches. And he girds it under his raiment upon his right thigh because he's left-handed. 
So why is this t detail mentioned in scripture? I mean, it's, it's kind of an odd detail that you have a son of the right hand who, who's left-handed, but it's going to mention this. And it's going to tell us about, you know, this dagger, this detail of this dagger. So what's what's going on here symbolically? Is it showing that Ehud, by placing the dagger as he did, was giving an unexpected type of attack? Yeah, I think that's part of it, is because he's left-handed, this isn't necessarily known to um, uh, Eglon, right? So this becomes sort of like in a surprise. Comes out of left field. Quite literally. Right. Though, though it, it ties the left and right together, right? Because he's a Benjamite who's left-handed. But he uses his left hand to pull this dagger from his right thigh. Now, that is kind of interesting because in order to do that, he had to reach across his body to be able to pull that dagger. Right. Yeah. So you reach across your body, you would have this dagger. It would be under his garment, but it would be accessible by reaching across his body, then pulling it out. Right. But there must be some some, some symbol here. And, and I see chiasm. I mean, that's to me written all over over this. But we, we're saying that he's about the 2520. We know the 2520 is two lines, right? So this is a two-edged sword. There's two lines. But we have the left side and the right side. Right? Because it's, it's a mirror. It's a chiasm. So you have these two. But if we think about when we draw this line, when we draw the line of the two 2520s, because I think that's what's even being described here. It's not just the 2520 itself, but the, the 2520 chiasm. We know that there's this civil war that's going on, both on the left side, so to speak, in 742, and on the right side in 1863. So the 2520 ties together these histories of ancient Israel with modern Israel. That is, it ties together this left hand and this right hand as a mirror. Does that help a little bit? It makes an interesting point. Okay, so now he's going to make it, you know, he brought, he brings the present to Eglon, king of Moab. So he is going to do this. Now it mentions Eglon's a very fat man, right? We know that the sword's going to go into his belly and even the haft or the handle is going to, be closed up inside of him, right? Even though his guts spill out. Um, so it's kind of a very strange story in that sense. Um, but Eglon, he represents, um, and the way that we're understanding this, that this has to do with... Um, now, he's going to gather unto him Amalek, Ammon and Amalek, right? So I remember we had discussions about this, trying to understand this at the time. 
So Ammon is a son of Lot, just as Moab is. But Amalek's a descendant of Esau. So, I mean, these are all relatives. Right? Agreed. So, initially, in this, this history of 9-11, I mean, we're dealing with, um, you know, first with Othniel, we're dealing with this Babylonian concept that really has possessed the Adventist church. The Adventist church is not Babylon, but I do think that it is in under Babylonian captivity in that period of time, right? Especially when you get to 1989. And, and people, you know, I mean, this is a problem that I, I, I've never quite understood. I mean, the Adventist church is not Babylon. Symbolically, it can never be Babylon. But it can be in Babylonian captivity. Because the call to come out of Babylon is not because somebody is Babylon, but because they're in Babylon. We call our people out of Babylon because they're in Babylonian captivity. So um, the Adventist church is worse than Babylon. Because we know better, or we should know better. So, so anyway, we have that with, with Othniel. But now we have these relatives that are oppressing. And this, again, would be messages that, or an understanding from the Adventist church. And the main thing that needs to be understood here, because they possess the city of the palm trees, that is, they've captured this message of the 2520, and that message needs to be restored. And what is restored, and the way that it's restored, has to do with this understanding of this chiastic structure. So it wasn't just that we took Miller's 2520 and just accepted it. Because there are Adventists who, who had understood Miller's 2520. Peter Plum understood it in 1989. And he wasn't the first one. I mean, I've talked to people who said they've studied the 2520 when they were children in their churches in various places in the world that the 2520 was being taught um, at different times. But no one except this message came to understand the prophetic mirror. Right? Nobody had put the two 2520s together until Jeff did, correct? Agreed. Right. And, and they couldn't have because there is a preparatory message that would be needed in order to do so. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the interesting thing about how light has unfolded to this movement is that you couldn't have just jumped to those conclusions without what had occurred before. The whole idea of how we place things on a line were necessary to understand the 2520. So when we get to, to our history and I go to, you know, what I put on the line, and whether it's correct or not, but the thinking that I have here is that you have this message of Ehud, the 2520 arrives, whenever that is, whether that's 2005 or however we look at that, it arrives to this movement. And then we have 2010. And I know in 2010, the main message there in Oklahoma is not the 2520. But, and I, and I don't even think it's, it's, it's exactly even about, 20, about Oklahoma. I think it's actually about 2010. So we have a paper by Johannes Koletsky. So he's a German, even though he's got a Polish last name. And, um, uh, he writes a paper on the story of Joseph, and he shows and illustrates the 2520, and his paper's on my academia site. Um, so he illustrates this 2520 um, 
by using the story of Joseph. So he can present the 2520 for northern Israel without an appeal to Leviticus 26. Now, I'm, I also come into the movement at that time. So I'm there in Oklahoma, um, even though there is not any presentation specifically on the 2520. I do discuss it with some people. I have no idea really about uh, Hiram Metzen's 2520 or anything. I, I know only about Miller's because I had read that. And, and Pete, some people rep talked about this a little bit, the prophetic mirror or something, but I didn't know what they were talking about. So it just didn't mean anything to me at that time. But we, by the time we get to Newport in 2012, um, now I had gone to the camp meeting in Oregon that uh, Emiliano put on um, in uh, 2011. And so I came to understand the 2520 then, that I understood the prophetic mirror. And um, so I started studying this out much more uh, in much more detail. I mean, that's sort of, because I started studying the 2520 in 2010 in November, and it wasn't really till September of 2011 that I, I recognized, I understood the 2520, what it was, and I... Um, actually began uh, promoting it on Facebook. So, so it took a while for me to, to study it out and to finally support it, but it was the understanding of the prophetic mirror, at least in its um, uh, simple detail, I guess. It wasn't, wasn't well um, structured yet at this point. And I actually came over the next year to really come to understand the 2520 with the complete prophetic mirror, uh, the 19 to 46 and all that. So, so from a personal point of view, I mean, I, I can see how this, this came about, but for Newport, this becomes, um, the point, whether it's April 27th, that's, that's just Jeff speaking at Newport. I mean, we could even mark maybe when the disfellowship occurred, you know, but it's dealing with Newport and, and we're taking that as, the empowerment of the first angel's message. Now, if we're going to connect this to the story of Ehud, so you know, so what we're, we're doing here is we're drawing out this line, but we're not we're not necessarily putting what events in in the story of Ehud that are being marked. We're just kind of keeping those in our mind. But I'm going to try working later to really draw out these lines um, in in more detail when I start putting these into a page. But but you see the point there of, of how I'm looking at that history. So when we get back here, um, Ehud is raised up, and now he's going to present this present to Eglon, king of Moab. He has this dagger, um, and, and then he had made an off, he offers the present after he had finished doing that. He sent the people away, but he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. Now, this just kind of seems odd the way the story is going. Um, because, you know, when you read this and you try to follow this train of thought, I'm, I'm not sure if we can. It, it, it makes sense to me. Right. So he sends them away. But it says he himself turned again from the quarries, or these are from the idols that were by Gilgal, and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. So what we understood is um, he sent the people that bear the present away. So this would be he would be the king of, of Moab, Eglon, right? So he sends them away. Is that what's happening? So Ehud makes an end of offering the present. The king sends the people away, right? That bear the present. Is that is that how we understand that? It would seem to. Okay. That's, I mean, it's hard sometimes in Hebrew because the he doesn't have to have 
you know, doesn't follow like it does in English, you know, so in English, if you have a he referring to some person, it's always the previous per person mentioned. Um, and so, but when it says when he made an end to offer the present, well, that seems to me to be Ehud. And then it says he sent away the people that bear the present, that would be Eglon. But then it says he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal. Well, that would be Ehud again. So the king sends them away. They travel away from the king. But then he's going to turn again. So he's going to go back. Right? And he says, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who, sent, who said, keep silence. So the king says, keep silence. And all that stood by him went from him. So that's what it seems to me is being done. And I know we, we sort of had this discussion before <clears throat> of what, what's actually happening. So how long this is going to take for him to get to Gilgal from where he is? We don't know exactly. Um, but he's going to go back. Now, now, the thing is, he had planned this already, but we don't know why he didn't initially just attack the king. Instead, he's going to be sent out. And then when he sees these idols, right, because that's what the quarries are, that were by Gilgal, he's going to turn back. Now, we have a secret errand. So what's the point of the secret that's being mentioned? Why is there a secret errand? Now, this word secret means to cover in a good or a bad, literal or figurative sense, backbiting, co covering, covert, disguise, hiding place, right? And, and where does this turning happen? you know, in this line. So if we're going to look at this line here and just try to deal with um, these symbols here. So he arrives. So Ehud arrives. Right. So let's let's try to do it with this way. So Ehud has a two-edged sword. He's, boy, that's bad. Um, he's a left-handed son of the right hand. And then um, he's going to bring a present. So would that be a formalization of the mes message? I think that's a logical application. Okay. So when he comes to the to the quarries of Gilgal, Uh, he comes to the quarry of Gilgal and turns, right? Can we put this at Newport? And if we did, why?
because this is a message of the 2520. So the 2520 is progressing through this movement as a message. Now, um, So what, what is the present? What, um, is this, this word present isn't the word normally like translated as gift. It means it, it's minka, uh, which means to apportion, that is to bestow a do donation, euphemistically tribute, specifically a sacrificial offering. Um, it is a gift and or oblation and offering the present a sacrifice. So, um, so when we look at the gift itself, the present that's delivered, um, this is some kind of offering that he's giving to uh, the king. But we know that the, pres the present here is delivered. We're putting it as 2010. So we need to understand that. And then we say that... Um, it's at these quarries that he's going to turn, the quarries of Gilgal, when he turns. Now, Gilgal is a wheel, right? It means rolling, something like that. So why would we put this at Newport in 2012? Is this because we're seeing that the situation, especially with the church, had turned? In other words, they are turning against the message itself or beginning to turn against this message itself? Okay. Well, it, it could be the church, but it also could be this movement is actually turning away from the church. There's that as well. So, I mean, one of the things that we see at this point in the movement, so prior to the 2520, I mean, Jeff, I mean, he has his membership with the conference, but he's a Seventh-day Adventist. He hasn't been disfellowshipped at this point. Um, and, and we see this as we're Seventh-day Adventists, we're supporting um, a reform movement to reform Seventh-day Adventists, but you know, we're not we're not calling people out of Adventist churches or anything at this point. Jeff isn't saying, you know, you need to leave at your churches. Um, but the church begins to turn against the message. But also this movement begins to turn away from the church. But there's a turning back to something. Now. That is to giving a message specifically. Now, now part of this is this 2520 here is a testing message because we know that the darkness has to do with, because if the 2520 is the message that's arriving, the darkness has to do with not understanding prophecies from Millerite history, that this movement, we say we're repeating Millerite history, but now this movement because of the charts and so forth, we're beginning to understand what that means that we're repeating Millerite history. And this 2520 um, allows us to, to come back to the original message. So we're turning away from the church's rejection of the 2520 and having to make a stand here, right? So th this becomes a bit of a dividing line uh, for this movement, right? So under that first message, this is the empowerment of that first message. Newport is. And with that empowerment, people then are going to be tested. And when we get to 2013, I put Sylvan Lake there, but a, t a new test is introduced. 
but it's still part of that 2520. And that has to do, that is, it takes the 2520 and it ties it to something else. And that's Ezra 7 9. And it's going to be at Ezra 7 9 that, or at, at Sylvan Lake, that Ezra 7 9 is mentioned, but also the four seven times. So now this, the people who have accepted the 2520 in this movement are going to be approached with new light. And that new light is to a large degree going to be rejected. There are many, many people who had followed Jeff in the past. Some who still hold to the 2520, not so much the ones that left you know, in 2014, but other followers of those movements that are still holding to the 2520 and to the charts to some degree. So I deal with these people. I've been banned from some of their Facebook pages, so I don't know what they're doing right now. But um, if I presented Leviticus 26 as the four seven times, that is is seen as heresy by these movements. That is, they don't even accept the prophetic mirror, many of these groups. They only accept Miller's 2520. And of course, they're going to be, um, uh, you know, anti-Trinitarians to the point that they actually don't see uh, the three persons of the Godhead, right? Um, they're going to take a lot of Uriah Smith's understanding of prophecy, so they're not going to accept Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Uh, things like that. And uh, so there's lots of different groups who still are promoting a 2520. But we have a unique take on the 2520 that I would think is, is, is still a minority position with, within Adventists who accept the 2520. And that was introduced at Sylvan Lake. Now, so we're going to say that this turning here is this turning point that's going to happen with Newport. But I'm going to put Sylvan Lake here because Sylvan Lake is addressing this introduction of the four seven times. So it's the arrival of the second angel's message, the second testing message in regard to the 2520. Now, if we go back to the story, so he now turns, and Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone, and Ehud said, I have a message from God, uh, from God unto thee, and he arose out of his seat, and Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. So when we have this dagger thrust into the belly of um, Eglon by Ehud, why would I put this, and, and the haft, haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. And the dirt came out. So, and then we said, Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. Okay, so we're going to have this as the arrival of the second angel's message. That's, that's the event. So how does that event relate to this diagram? How does this relate to Sylvan Lake? So one is we would look at it as a shut door, right? So it's a new message that's being presented that if you don't accept the old message, you can't benefit from the second message. So the second message is now going to be introduced to those who have accepted the first message. And what are the symbols here? The sword going into his belly. All of these different details. How would we address this? OK. 
Okay, so we're going to have here um, the sword. Closed doors. In other words, this would be a very cutting message. Well, I don't know. <laughs> That's the way I would look at it. So we know it's a two-edged sword. It's going to be, so there's two messages that, two presentations that are both on the same topic at Sylvan Lake. Both Jeff and I present the four seven times. And we both had figured it out the week before. Right. So we have this new understanding on Leviticus 26. Not everyone fully understands the implication of it. Right. Because part the main implication of the correct understanding of Leviticus 26 that Miller didn't have is that we can see its fulfillment in uh, the progressive destruction of four for literal Israel that's then going to be followed by these three decrees that end these periods. And those three decrees that end the literal application of Leviticus 26 are also going to commence the 2300 days. So this isn't well developed yet, but it's there in 2013. Yeah, it's there in my understanding. I have a sketchy idea that it's going that direction, but I still don't fully know the, the chronological details, right? Those are going to be worked out in 2014. So in 2014, um, when I present in Arkansas, um, that's going to be the empowerment of that message that arrived at Sylvan Lake. That is, there we're going to have the four seven times clearly presented. But we're saying that this sword being put into the belly of Eglon, I mean, this is a message to defeat Eglon, right? Because we're in oppression by Moab. And this is going to be the second angel's message. So why would this sword be marking the second angel's message? Why is this attack on Eglon, you know, not an empowerment to the message? Or but why is it here at Sylvan Lake? as the arrival of the second. Well, is Eglon representative of Protestant understandings? Y yes. No doubt about so, that. Okay. So when you have Ahud bringing this sword is the sword then representative of Miller's rules well it's line upon line it's a two-edged sword right it is the 2520 um, prophetic mirror I get that but the use so that, of Miller that comes, that comes from Miller's rules really Okay, but the use of Miller's rules is something that the church had and has for many years abandoned. Yeah. You know, the most amazing thing to me is um, when you look at those people that oppose the 2520, and, and I can think of, uh, um, what's his name? Bohr, I can't think of his first name. Um, Stephen Bohr. Stephen Bohr. You know, he does a presentation where he uh, attacks the 2520. And I, I wrote a response to Stephen Bohr. Um, he mentions that there are two 2520s, but he's only going to address the one. That is, he's going to address Miller's 2520 by itself. Now, that's an extremely unfair assessment of the 2520 in this movement. Because the one thing we know is that 
if like I don't support Miller's 2520 on its own. And the reason I don't is there's more to it, right? Miller had been given light from God. There's no doubt his commencement of this 25, 20 years is correct. But we know we need Hiram Edson's 25, 20 in order to support Miller's. Miller's can't really stand on its own once it's examined, right? Because God often does this. He gives us light, and we don't understand that light yet, right? So we have our reasons for understanding the light, but that has to be intensified. Like we need to be able to see all of the details so that we can present it. And I don't believe that you could just support Miller's 2520, the direct jump from the seven times to the 25, 20 years. And so what was given to this movement was an explanation of Leviticus 26 that basically, as far as I'm concerned, is impenetrable. That is, it is the way that we have established the 2520 since 2013. You can't argue against. I mean, you can if you want to, but there's no logical argument against it um, because it's very solid. Now, but there are these closed doors here as well. So, so we, this is an application of Miller's rules to something that Miller just didn't have enough time to study, right? If, if we follow Miller's rules, we arrive at this understanding of Leviticus 26. And, and it wasn't just a simple, you know, we just got this other 2520. There's lots involved in understanding Daniel 4 and Daniel 5 and the story of Joseph and all these different things that we studied that all come together to support the 2300 days and the 70 weeks and the 1260s and the 1290s and the 1335. All these come together, all these lines of prophecy. And that's because of Miller's rules, right? If we were using the church's interpretation, where people like um, Steve Wahlberg in his attack, and even Stephen Bohr's, they're attacking, they're, they're not even trying to attack the correct view of the 2520, they're just attacking Miller's. But even if they were to look at ours, they would, they would never come to those conclusions because of the methods that they're using. Now, I don't know how many people, you know, who were following this movement in 2012, um, you know, accepted um, or rejected this message based upon what happened at Newport. But we do know that people who accepted the 2520, that were still followers of the 2520 after Newport, that by... 2014, these people are going to fall away, right? So, so the message that comes at Sylvan Lake is this sword that's going to go into the belly of the king of Eglon, which is an attack against a false system of study. That we can agree on, right? Agreed. Now, um, so, so we're going to take that part. We know the doors close. So is there a closed door in connection with uh, the arrival of the second angel's message in 1844? Did, did the Protestants who closed their doors to the Millerites, did they yes. really not have the door closed to themselves? That is, they shut their own door. They closed their probation. Correct. Because if they weren't benefited by the first message, they can't be benefited by the second. Right. 
Okay, so we have these doors closed. And these doors then are two levered doors, right? That are then going to be shut. So this represents a chiasm. Now, Ehud's going to go through for through the porch. Now, when we looked at this, this is a row, a row of pillars. So he's going to go through the, the, the row of pillars. And then he's going to shut the doors of the parlor. Right. And then he's going to lock them as he leaves. Now, and then we're going to have a tarrying time, right? So the servants come, they see the doors are locked, right? And so they make some assumptions about what's happening. And then they tarried till they were ashamed. And behold, he opened not the doors, that is, Eglon didn't, of the parlor. Therefore, they took a key and opened them, and behold, their Lord was fallen down, dead on the earth. So we have this tarrying time. And it says, Ehud escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the quarries and escaped unto Syriath, which is, uh, means roughness. It's a place in Palestine. We couldn't find out much about the place. So is this a formalization of the message? Or are we going to look at that further? Right. So when we're looking at this line, uh, we know we have a tarrying time and it's going to be in the middle of the tarrying time. That we're going to have. Uh, so I'm just going to put tarrying time here. Right. So we have this tarrying time here. And that's going to be the. The formalization of the second message. So there's going to be these shut doors. He's going to leave. They're going to tarry. And um, the 2520 is going to pass Gilgal and, and continue. Right? Is this making sense of how I'm placing this story in the events above? How can it not make sense? And we can also see the mirror aspect of it too with, with the Gilgal on either sides of this center of this chiasm. And then we have Arkansas in uh, 2014. Now there I put uh, not October 22nd that you see in the line above with Shamgar. I'm actually going to put um, October 20th and 21st. These are my presentations in Arkansas where I present. Uh, so this would be in this context, uh, the empowerment of the message. I mean, we could also, in, you know, include that I presented in Alberta too, uh, chronology, but this is going to be chronology. So um, I guess what I have to take from here, I'm doing this wrong here. So if we go to the story, this is going to be the, he's going to blow the trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim. Right. And he's going to say, the Lord's delivered this enemies, right? The Moabites into your hand. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab and suffered not a man to pass over. They slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty and all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years. So what we have to do here is we're going to have to have this trumpet. So this is the trumpet that's going to be blown, uh, calling Ephraim. So he blows the trumpet. So this, I'm saying, is the introduction of this chronology.
So if we're looking at this line, and this is the 2520, we now have, um, we have the formalization of this message. So specifically, we're looking at, and, and this is where, you know, we, we could, you know, maybe try to do something different. But in Arkansas on June 22nd, why we put that there, this is during the tearing time, we're going to have this other message that was also introduced with the 2520, which was Ezra 7-9. That's going to be presented at that camp meeting by Noel or Noel, right? Now you're talking about an Arkansas camp meeting. I stepped away for just a moment. Yeah, so in June 22, 2014, Noel right. presents Ezra 7-9. Now that's- Noel Del Rosal. What's that? Noel Del Rosal. Yeah, Noel Del Rosal, right? So he presents the chronology. Now I'd figured that out back in 2013 on, uh, uh, I believe it was August 31st was the last day of that camp meeting. And I'd figured it out on that Sabbath. Um, but um, we're gonna have, well, nearly a year later, 10 months later, Noel is gonna present it. Because I'm not anybody in the message at this time. So even though I figured it out, how, you know, the first day of the first of the fifth month worked, um, Noel's going to do it in a way that that's simple. He presents it out. He draws it all out nice and neatly. So you can count out the days and see that which day is the first day of the fifth month. And that's going to be... Um, you know, obviously August 15th, that they're going to have this. Now, we didn't really fully understand all of that chronology until recently because we worked it out in much more detail. So we still had some misunderstandings about the midnight cry. But as far as understanding the first day of the first month, we understand it now. Now, how's that related to the 2520? Because we're saying this is the formalization of this message. And... You know, and somebody could argue, well, maybe it's my presentation in October where I take um, the 2520 and I lay it out. You know, I have the whole prophetic mirror. I do that as one of my presentations, the 2,604 years. Um, so why, why, is, um, why am I saying that it's going to be what Noel presents? I'm not recalling everything about his presentation. Okay, well, his, an presentation, yeah, his presentation is pretty simple. All he does is he lays out the chronology from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. Nice, neat, clean drafting type of drawing, right? Not messy like my lines. And, and he counts out each day, right? So you can count the number of days from the first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month. And you can see exactly which day is the first day of the fifth month, that it's going to be August 15th, right? And then you're gonna count the rest of the days and you're gonna see that it's gonna be 118 and um, whatever it is, 69. So it's not 120 and 70, like Jeff thought. But anyway, we're going to know which day is the first day of the fifth month. Now, this becomes extremely important, obviously, to understanding Boston, because we don't understand Boston at that time. But now we understand the first day of the fifth month. And the question is, how does the first day of the fifth month, the understanding of that, relate to the 2520? Is it because this is a return to the old paths, a return to Jerusalem? Right. So it's a return, right? So this return is important 
So there's something here about what, I mean, without this understanding of the first day of the fifth month, I don't think we really could have developed this message to where we're, we're getting with this, um, this chronology, right? We need this understanding of Millerite history. And, and what we're having here too is these opening up of these seals of Millerite history. That's part of what happens in these lines, that there is an opening up of this, this, the trumpets or the, the thunders that have been sealed, right? So the thunders have been sealed, they're being opened up. And this is an important opening up. But it's not the empowerment of the message that happens in June 22nd. To me, it's the formalization. The empowerment is October 20th and 21st. Because now we have this message of chronology being presented to this movement. And, and that, that is going to be rejected. Now, when it comes to these groups that left in 2014, I mean, they've already left here, right? They've already left by June right? because, I mean, it's right around that time. Uh, I don't know if it's May or something like that, or if it's early June, whenever Jamal's letter was um, started to be shared. I mean, I, d I don't know when I saw it on Facebook first, but it was um, maybe just before our camp meeting in Alberta, but it, I'm not sure the date. But, uh, but I still believe that part of the reason these, this movement left, even though we have all these other reasons about no public evangelism and the controversy over the book of Joel, What, why are they really leaving this movement? What is it that they're not wanting to accept? Miller's rules. Okay, so it's Miller's rules that they don't want to accept. And so the Sylvan Lake camp meeting in Alberta, you know, I know none of you were there, uh, but the way that it happened is that Jamal was there first and then he leaves and then Jeff shows up for the second half of the camp meeting. Um, so Jamal's not there when Jeff's there. So there's already this, this separation and Jamal doesn't uh, hang out at the camp meeting. He's got at his hotel room that he has to stay in. So, you know, he's doing that, uh, um, that shtick where he's this big important speaker, right? So he's not like the, the common people. Um, we also have some presentations being made against Jeff, though it's done in a covert way. That is, Jeff is being attacked as a narcissist, which is the last thing Jeff is. But, you know, it's an easy attack to make about anybody if you misrepresent them. Um, especially somebody who's has responsibility because we can just point out, you know, different flaws or different circumstances or misrepresent different things that have happened. And uh, so anyway, Jeff is being attacked at this time, though I wasn't fully aware at that time that who that's the one who was being attacked, but because they didn't mention Jeff is the narcissist. They just did this presentation about narcissism. Um. And uh, so, so we have, but we have an introduction. Now, the thing that's weird is Emiliano is the one who presents Ezra 7 9, but Emiliano is going to be out, right? His, his ministry is going to reject the light that comes from what he presented. Like something that he was so convinced that God had shown him. The light that comes from that is going to be light that he rejects. So just because God gives you light doesn't mean that you're going to accept it. 
You may present it and then reject it. Now, why is that? Why can't we be secure when we present light, when we receive light and even present it? Our particular light. Okay, so that light may shine into the darkness that we don't want to leave. And so we have to walk in that light. It's not enough to, to, to have uh, seen light, even understand light, and even to present light, you have to walk in that light. So so there was this opportunity that this, these people in the movement had to accept light. And so, you know, some ways we could say, well, these people didn't really pass the first test. But that light that comes, that arrives in 2013, they're, they're not ever going to accept that light. And so even though we have this proclamation of this message, they're not going to want to look at it. And so they miss out on the blessings that could have happened. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1335, right? That's the arrival of the second angel. But many people come to that point and they receive light, but it doesn't mean that they're going to follow it. Now, so what would be the arrival of the third message? after the empowerment. So I'm saying that this proclamation of chronology in October, uh, what would we put as this closed door? Because this, this is the end of this line of Ehud. So we haven't, we haven't marked a date yet. So. Could the closed door be the beginning of Elder Jeff's presentation on Habakkuk's two tables? No, because that's way over in 2012. Okay. Yeah. So in 2015, there's a camp meeting in Arkansas, and it's in October again, I believe. No, I'm not there. But I am. And I'm there in a paper called um, why there is not a 25 20 year of 25 20 years of continual punishment for literal Israel found in Leviticus 26 and this is the hot topic of the camp meeting according to people who were there people wanted Jeff to deal with me back in 2015 So the groups that are left, that are still in this movement, um, we have now a third message that arrives. And this message, of course, is going to connect as we move up these lines, right? So we, we have this line here, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. But if we go above to the judge's line itself, we're going to see that we're going to have a message here that's then going to arrive. And, you know, my understanding here is that what we have is we have a closed door, we have a new message. And that new message that has to do with the 2520 is going to develop into a message relating to time. So if we're going to go to the story that we have here in Ehud's line and finish off um, 
So they're going to say, uh, he said unto them, follow after me. So this is Ehud, right? He blows this trumpet. For the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab and suffered not a man to pass over. So what's the fords of Joab or ford, fords of Jordan? What is the Jordan representing? Are the Fords of Jordan the reestablishment of the importance of the 2520? Okay. Well, I mean, literally, what are the Fords of Jordan? First, they're rivers. Okay. Rivers. But it divides. I mean, remember, they crossed the Jordan River to come into the land of promise. So we know that tribes are on the other side of the Jordan, right? On right. The so they cross the Jordan. They're going to cross the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month. Right. So that's significant initially when they come into the promised land. And you're going to have Gilgal there uh, in that area on the west side. But it's the way it's the way to get back. Obviously, it's fords, right? So these are fords. This is a place where you cross a river. And I don't know how many people have crossed rivers, but um, there's just places where uh, you're able to cross. There's usually rocks or some kind of formation. Um, the water's going to run. The river's going to be a bit wider. It's not going to run. Uh, it's not going to be very steep. It's going to be shallower um, as long as it's not in flood. And these are just the places where you can cross. So it's a crossing point. We know that we deal with it in other places, dealing with the Shibboleth. And that has to do with Ephraim as well, right? But here he's going to call the people out of Mount Ephraim. And so who is Ephraim? A symbol of Joseph. Okay, a symbol of Joseph. And and these people are, uh, he's a Benjamite, Ehud is, right? So so he's he's another descendant of... Of Joseph. Of, yeah, of Rachel, right? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so you've got, um, so they're, they're closely related, you know, through the same mother. Um, you know, it's northern Israel. They become the largest tribe. So that's of Joseph, right? And, and Ephraim sometimes is just referred to as Joseph. Because Joseph got the double portion. Now, we also have 10,000. 10,000 represents, um, if you put it into years, it's basically 27 years and a 0.3, however you look at it. Um, so it's, it's a symbol of 273 of the Levites. And this message is primarily a message that's being developed to, for the Levites. So this is... Um, calling Levites to this message. But here they're going to, it's going to be symbolized by killing 10,000 of the men of Moab, right? So that's a symbol there. 
And, and then Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years. So four score is 80 years. And then we're going to address, uh, finish off addressing this and looking at Shamgar. But, you know, we look at Shamgar as specifically the message dealing with uh, July 18th. <clears throat> so when we just finish off here, because our time is almost up. <coughs> I'm saying that that there, this message, there's now an arrival of a third message. And that's going to be the message dealing with um, the completion of this message of the understanding of the 2520. Now, I could have put this as, as, the, as the empowerment and put something else as the, as the arrival of the third message. And that is possible. So I'm not stuck on this. I could put both of these just 2014 as the formalization, but 2015 as the empowerment. The reason why I put this as the empowerment, well, I want the trumpet here as the empowerment. So, I mean, that could be here too. And then all we're going to get <coughs> with the arrival of the third angel is rest, right? Which is symbolized by 80 years. Okay, so I'm sharing the Bible still. That's because I forgot to hit share. There we go. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to come back to this tomorrow. Well, no, we're not going to come back tomorrow. We're going to come back to this on Sunday. So tomorrow there's not going to be a meeting because I have to go to the dentist. And Heidi does too. So, so I'm going to have to send an email out to remind people. But anyway, any final comments before we close with prayer? I want people to think about this before Sunday. Right. There's a lot to think about. Yeah. Okay. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this study this morning. Please bless each person as they contemplate the light that you've given us and as we seek to correct it and refine this message. Um, may your Holy Spirit continue to work in our lives. May your angels watch over us. And we ask that you can bring us again together on Sunday to study these things. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.